In our previous study, we used the text found in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, which reads, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. <clears throat> The study of the plan of salvation would not be complete without reference to the great mystery of the Incarnation. The fact that Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, would become a man and live with the human race is a mystery that is not explained to us. One of the issues raised by Bible students throughout the years is in what human nature did Jesus come? Was it in the nature of Adam, in his sinless state before he fell, or in the nature he had after he sinned? In this chapter today, we will be looking at this issue and see what God has revealed to us. This study is not dealing with the question of the divinity of Jesus. We presented that in the previous lecture. And it, it is an accepted doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You can read the book, Seventh-day Adventists Believe, chapter 4, which describes our church's position on the divinity of Jesus. We will, however, look at the human nature of Jesus while he was incarnate on earth, as this has been a subject of debate and dispute for many years in various parts of the world, and in the Adventist Church. We will study together and try to find common ground by which differing views in this area can be brought together into harmony. A good starting point is found in Deuteronomy 29, 29, which we have looked at previously, which says, the secret things belong to God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the works of this law. As Paul states above, the incarnation is a mystery. It cannot be explained by any known human laws. However, the Greek word for mystery in 1 Timothy 3.16 is mysterion, which in the New Testament refers, quote, to something that God wills to make known to those who are willing to receive his revelation, rather than to something that he desires to keep secret. That's a quote from the Seventh Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 610. <clears throat> what God has revealed is for us to study and understand, but what he has not revealed is better left alone. Based on what God has revealed, we can come to a better understanding of the great truths of the Incarnation. As I just stated a few moments ago, this debate has raged for some quarters and is still an issue in some areas. In what human nature did Jesus come? Was it in the human nature of Adam before he sinned, which is called in theological terms pre-lapsarian? or in human nature of Adam after he sinned, which is called post-lapsarian. One aspect of this debate, often overlooked by the pre-lapsarian view, is that Jesus had Adam's sinless human nature. He would not have been able to die. Before Adam sinned, he had what was known as conditional immortality. The condition was obedience to God's requirements. The fact that Jesus did die could be used by proslapsarians to support their view. The solution to this problem, however, will become evident as we pursue this study further. First of all, I want to deal with the question of the physical nature of Jesus. He came in human flesh. 
Some verses in Scripture that some tried to use to build and support for the post-lapsarian teacher really should be understood as referring to his physical nature rather than to his spiritual nature. For example, Romans 8 verse 3, Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Some theologians have pointed out that likeness is not the same as sameness. Hebrews 2 17, Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren. Keeping this thought in mind, we would find common ground for both sides of this debate who would agree that physically Jesus did not have the same body that Adam had before he sinned. Some have suggested that Adam was many feet taller than men are today. Some have suggested it may be as high as double the height of ordinary men today, and that he probably would have weighed half a ton or more. That would be a massive giant. It's accepted that Jesus came, however, in weakened human nature. And Ellen White supports this view. Quote from Questions on Doctrine, page 656, says, He, Christ, took our human nature and bore the infirmities and degeneracies of the race. Desire of Ages, page 49, says, But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the workings of the great law of heredity. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us an example of a sinless life. Everyone is agreed when we discuss the incarnation that Jesus lived a sinless life because the scriptures are very clear on that issue. <clears throat> John 8 verse 46 says, Jesus speaking, which of you convinceth me of sin? Jesus challenged the Pharisees of his day to point out any sin in his life and they could not do so. 1 Peter 2.22 is very emphatic. It says, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. The teaching of Scripture on this issue is clear, and uh, as far as I know, all are in agreement with the sentiments expressed. Jesus lived a sinless life. If he had not done that, he could not have been our saviour. That is clear. Part of the reason why there has been a difficulty in this area of theology is based on the fact that the Bible has two definitions of sin. In fact, the Bible has more than two definitions of sin. For example, a thought of foolishness is said to be sin in the Bible. Another definition that we're not going to spend too much time on today is the fact that the Bible says, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. That is called a sin of omission. So we have sins of commission and sins of omission. And I think most of us are probably more guilty of sins of omission than we are of sins of commission. We're not robbing banks, we're not going around murdering people, but often we do not do the good that we should do. And that's the thought upon which we can meditate with benefit. Many problems and misunderstandings have arisen in theology because of the failure to understand that in the Bible there are two concepts concerning sin which we will emphasize today. All except that doing wrong actions is called sin in the Scriptures. For there are many verses that teach it. For example, 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Those sins of commission mentioned there. But in the Bible, sin is also used to refer to man's moral state after the fall. 
Even when we are not committing sins of action, we are still sinners by nature. The scriptures often refer to man's sinful nature as the carnal nature. See Romans 7, 14, 1 Corinthians 3, 3, or refer to it as the old man, Ephesians 4, 22 and Colossians 3, 9. When Adam and Eve sinned by their act of disobedience, they lost their sinless nature with which they were created and became sinful in nature. They then could not pass on to their children the sinless nature that they had lost. But instead, their children and every human being born to the world except Jesus has been born with the sinful nature. Strange as it may seem, this fact is not fully understood by some people. Some years ago, a very zealous layman read a paper I had written on the plan of salvation. And he rang me up on the telephone and said, you say that we are born, babies are born with sinful natures. I said, yes. He said, I don't believe that. I was a bit stunned. So I said to him, what do you believe? He said, we are not born with sinful natures. We get a sinful nature when we commit our first act of sin. Immediately I saw the weakness of his argument and I said to him, tell me, brother, if a baby is born, lives for 10 minutes and dies, you can't say that baby has committed a sinful act in those 10 minutes. Does it need Jesus to go to heaven or can it go to heaven without a saviour? And he would not answer me. He went off on a tangent. I brought him back to the question and presented it to him again. He went off on another tangent, refusing to answer it. I brought him back and reminded him that he was avoiding my question and uh, asked him again to give me an answer. Whereupon he said, well, if it's got no sinful nature, it's got no sin. It can go to heaven without a saviour. I said to him, I could not disagree with you more. Everybody who gets to heaven will get there because of the merits of Jesus, including babies that have never committed any acts of sin because they are born with a carnal nature. As, Jesus, as the Bible clearly tells us, for example, look at Psalm 51 verse 5. This is the Psalm where David is repenting about his sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah, her husband. And David said, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That is not a statement that it was a sinful act for David's mother to have a, him born as a baby. Because God has blessed marriage and encouraged us to have families. But Psalm 58 verse 3 says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Well, that's the wicked. What about the righteous families? Well, Isaiah 48, 8 says, The house of Jacob, or God's people, is called a transgressor from the womb. So even the children of believers are born with the sinful nature, transgressors from the womb, it says. And Psalm 14, 1 to 3 says, There is none that doeth good, no, not one. See also Romans 3, 17, uh, 19 and on. Ephesians 2, verse 12, We are all dead in trespasses and sins. And Romans 7 is an interesting chapter. Let me present some experts from it, extracts from it. Romans 7, 14. I am, notice the present tense, not I was, I am carnal, sold under sin. Paul is describing his condition as a believer. I am carnal, he says, as a believer. Verse 15, for that which I allow not, what I hate, that I do. He says, I, I do things I don't want to do, things that I hate. I still find myself doing them. 
we can identify with that. I'm sure many of us can. Then in Romans 7 and verse 15, he says, I am, present tense, carnal, sold unto sin. And again in verse 17, sin that dwelleth in me. There's something living in me, dwelling in me, that is, uh, leads me to do wrong actions. That is in my flesh, he says, dwelleth no good thing. What does Ellen White say about this situation? Let's look at some of her quotations. Great Controversy, 469 to 470. Christians will feel the promptings of sin. We have a carnal nature, and as Christians we feel temptations from within. Acts of the Apostles, page 518. Evils within can awaken evils from without. So there is evil within us. The Bible Comedy, Ellen White's Statement, Volume 2, page 1032. As long as life shall last, there is need of guarding the affections and passions with a firm purpose. There is inward corruption. How often I've wished that that was not the case. It would be easy for me to live a victorious life if I didn't have a carnal nature. But if we're honest with ourselves, we all have to admit that we have thoughts and feelings which are not in accordance with God's will for us and that from time to time we fall into temptation and do things that we do not really want to do in our Christian life. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 8, page 313. Paul, the Apostle Paul, Paul's will and desires every day conflicted with duty and the will of God. Instead of following inclination, he did God's will, whatever, however crucifying to his own nature. And here's a quote from Signs of the Times that Ellen White wrote in the 23rd of March, 1888. We cannot say, I am sinless, till this vile body is changed and fashioned like unto his glorious body. And that, of course, is a reference to the second advent. 1 Corinthians 15, this mortal puts on immortality, this corruption puts on incorruption. Second coming of Jesus. That text, uh, for a quote from Elder White alone, uh, disproves the doctrine of uh, perfectionism that some people teach, whereby they say that we can get rid of the carnal nature in this life before the second coming and live sinless lives like Jesus did. Desire of Ages, 122, 123. In our own strength, it is impossible for us to deny the clamors of our fallen natures. And steps to Christ 67. Even after conversion, we recognize our sinfulness. If we don't see our own moral deformity, it is evidence that we have not seen the beauty of Christ's character. Close quotes. So where we have the situation that we are born sinners by nature. Now let's look at the atonement that Jesus made. First of all, we know that the Bible tells us that Jesus took our sins or our sinful actions upon himself when he went to the cross. And he made atonement for our sins. Let us look further at this situation. What has gone before lays the foundation for a consideration of the twofold nature of the atoning sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. Apart from those who subscribe to the moral influence theory of the atonement, which we reject, all agree that when Jesus went to the cross, he took the responsibilities for our sins. He died a vicarious death on our behalf. This is the plain teaching of scriptures. What does the word vicarious mean? I looked it up on the dictionary. And the dictionary says, 
Something that is endured or some experience that you pass through which brings benefit to somebody else rather than to yourself. Vicarious atonement. Jesus made a vicarious atonement for our sins. Isaiah 53 verse 6. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. There are in this passage of Scripture, the suffering servant poem of Isaiah, a few last verses of 52 and all of 53, there are in all a dozen or so references that speak about his vicarious suffering on our behalf. The moral inference theory that I referred to just a few moments ago may not be familiar to some listeners, so let me define it. The moral inference theory says Jesus did not take our sins upon him when he went on the cross. That is, of course, contradicting what we just read in Isaiah 53. But there are some Christians that have gone down that road, which we cannot. Jesus took our sins when he went on the cross. The Bible says so. Moral inference theory says he didn't take our sins. All he did on the cross was to demonstrate by his death that he loved us. But he did nothing about our sins. Another text of Scripture is 1 Peter 2, verse 24, which says, speaking about Jesus, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree by whose stripes we were healed. Nothing can be more clear than these verses of Scripture that I have read. By taking on himself our sins, responsibility for our transgressions, and dying on the cross, he atoned for our sinful actions. The doctrine of vicarious substitution is the very foundation of the gospel. It was seen in the Garden of Eden when an animal died instead of Adam and Eve. God had said to Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat the fruit, you will die. But we know they did not die that day, but there was a death that day, a substitute death, which God accepted for the time being. An innocent lamb died in the place of Adam and Eve, substitution. It is also seen in the experience of Abraham and the test he had with Isaac, his son. Instead of offering his son as a sacrifice, as he was asked to do, God stopped him at the last moment and drew his attention to a ram that was caught in a bush behind him by its horns and could not escape. And he was told, get that ram and offer him in the place of your son. Substitution. And the whole sanctuary service where the children of Israel brought their sacrifices, their sin offerings to the temple, the sanctuary first in the desert and the temple after Solomon built it, those animals died as substitutes representing the coming death of Jesus who would die as our substitute. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he died the death that uh, we should die because of our sinful actions. So substitution is seen as the great basic truth of the plan of salvation. And of course the devil doesn't like it and he has tried to get people to turn away from it. So Jesus made a perfect atonement for our sinful actions. But what about our sinful nature with which we were born? Did he take our sinful nature upon him? If he took our sinful nature upon him, he would have to take it vicariously because he was not born with it, as we are told. To deny this conclusion would leave one to the conclusion that babies who have never sinned could go to heaven without a saviour. This does not mean that Jesus was born with our sinful nature, but if he did not care for the problem of our sinful natures, then his atonement would only be half an atonement, not a complete one. The only way that he could atone for our sinful nature would be to take it vicariously. 
if he was born with it, as post-lapsarians claim, then he would need a saviour, just as the baby does, who has never committed any act of sin. A clarification of this point could be the basis for reconciliation and harmony between the two opposing views that have divided so many in the church in recent years. Those who have held to the pro-Slapsarian reply heavily on Ellen White's statements. Pre-Lapsarians have tried to explain the statement by using the post-Lapsarians, used by the pro-Slapsarians by saying that they apply to the physical nature of Jesus only, which we have already seen was weakened by thousands of years of heredity. A close look at some of these statements from Ellen White in the light of the twofold aspect of his atonement may well help us to better understand what she was saying. E.G. White, quote, Medical Ministry, 181, says, He took upon his sinless nature, our sinful nature, that he might know how to succor those that are tempted. Review and Herald, 15th of December, 1896, which is quoted in Questions on Doctrine, pages 656 and 657. Open quotes. Clad investments of humanity, the Son of God came down to the level of those he wished to save. In him was no guile of sinfulness. He was ever pure and undefiled. Yet he took upon himself our sinful nature. He would have to do that vicariously because he was not born with it. Desire of Ages, page 112. Notwithstanding that the sins of a guilty world were laid upon Christ, notwithstanding the humiliation of taking upon himself our fallen nature, the voice from heaven declared him to be the Son of the Eternal. Now let's look at this question. Was Jesus born with a sinful human nature? As we have already stated, Jesus was sinless in his life. He never committed an act of sin. The teaching that he vicariously took upon himself our sinful natures means that this was a choice that he made, just as he chose to take our sinful actions upon himself and be responsible for them when he went on the cross. The Bible is very clear that Jesus was not born with sinful human nature. For example, 2 Corinthians 5.21, He knew no sin. Hebrews 7, verse 26, He was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. 1 John 3, 5, In him is no sin. The Apostle Paul didn't say that about himself. He said, I find sin dwells in me. But the Bible says that in Jesus is no sin. Luke 23, 14, Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Pilate's wife said, have nothing to do with that just man. And Gabriel in Luke 1, 35 said, that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the son of the highest. Mark 1, 24, the devil said Jesus was the holy one of God. Ellen G. White supports this Bible position. Signs of the Times, 28, 1901, she said, he took the nature, but not the sinfulness of man. Signs of the Times, June 9, 1898. In taking upon himself man's nature in its fallen condition, Christ did not in the least participate in its sin. He was subject to the infirmities and weaknesses of, by which man is encompassed. We should have no misgivings in regard to the perfect sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. So Ellen White was quite clear about that. And how our high calling, page 59, she said, Jesus was sinless. Then she added, with this exception, his condition was as yours. With this exception, 
this condition was of yours. And if you want to read more on this, you can go to the book Questions on Doctrine, Seventh-day Adventist Answer Questions on Doctrine, pages 650 to 652. You'll find some other quotations there that I have not taken time to include in this study today. Now I want to come to the question of the baptism of Jesus. It's very important. Many have wondered why Jesus was baptized when he had never committed any act of sin. To answer this question, many have expressed the thought that he went through the ceremony of baptism in order to give us an example of what we should do. Yes, he gave us an example, all right, but he didn't need to do it for himself. Others have suggested that he was baptized so that his baptism could count for those who never had a chance to be baptized, such as the thief on the cross. Hanging on the cross, the thief accepted Jesus as his substitute and saviour and asked for him a place in his coming kingdom. And Jesus promised him that he would have such a place. But the thief was never baptised. So they argue that Jesus baptised him, got John to baptise him as a vicarious baptism that could count for those who do not have the privilege of being baptised because of circumstances. Both these reasons, no doubt, have some merit, but there seems to be a deeper meaning when we read what Ellen White said about the baptism of Jesus. And this is taken at a general confession in April 1901. Ellen White gave an early morning talk on April the 3rd. And this talk she gave was printed in the General Conference Bulletin the next day. It's dated April 4, 1901. And in the fourth paragraph of this article, which she gave as a talk, she said this, quote, The Lord can take every one of us in his embrace, for his arm encircles the race. Let us remember this, that after Christ had taken the necessary steps in repentance, conversion, and faith, in behalf of the human race, he went to John to be baptized of him in Jordan. John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Jesus answered, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. When he came up out of the water, he knelt down on the banks of the Jordan and offered a prayer such as had never before entered heaven. While he was praying, the heavens opened and the glory of God in the form of a dove of burnished gold rested upon him. And from the highest heaven was heard the voice of the infinite one. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I want you to notice the words she says here in the middle of this paragraph. She said, after Christ had taken the necessary steps in repentance, conversion, and faith in behalf of the human race, he went and got baptized. Jesus did not have to repent. He did not have to be converted. He did not have to exercise faith. He was above all those things in his Christian life. But she says he did go through these steps, the necessary steps, on behalf of the human race. In other words, they were vicarious experiences. She went through a stage of repentance on behalf of us. After all, when we repent of a sin, do we ever fall into the same sin again? Our repentance, therefore, seems to be very inadequate. When we repent, do we ever find that we need to repent of the same mistake again? Human frailty is our problem. Jesus did it on our behalf. And the expression of faith and trust in his heavenly Father. So since we believe that Jesus never sinned, he had no need to repent nor to be converted. The only way that this, this passage can be understood 
and interpreted is to come to the conclusion that Jesus went through the steps of repentance, conversion, faith and baptism for each of us vicariously because our repentance, our confession, our exercise of faith is so imperfect that his actions done on our behalf are perfect and acceptable to the Father. He also took our sinful natures and then he vicariously went through these steps so that we <clears throat> must take in order to be right with God. After all, we have to admit that our repentance is rather imperfect to say the least, for after we have repented, we so often fall into sin again. Likewise, our conversion is less than perfect for the same reason. And the same could be said about the exercise of our faith and our baptism. We could therefore conclude that Jesus took these steps vicariously because we take them so imperfectly. His perfect steps then are counted for us when we accept him as our saviour. Thus the gospel of righteousness by faith appears to have a far deeper meaning than many of us have seen in the past. How thankful we should be all of us should be for a wonderful Saviour who not only saves us by forgiving our sins but also vicariously took our sinful human nature and then also took vicariously the steps that are necessary for our salvation because we cannot even repent nor be converted perfectly. What a wonderful Saviour we have. Thank God for Jesus. Amen. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.